This happened the night before Halloween, back in 2010. At that time I was a freshman in college, living on campus. That year the 31st fell on a Monday, so students' festivities went on the Sunday before. During the afternoon around 7, I was outside playing soccer on a field near my place and I noticed an SUV driving by several times. I only noticed this vehicle because we kicked the ball over the fence several times and that car was present at least twice when we were climbing the fence to get the ball. I didn't think much of it and proceeded to go to a party later that night. My girlfriend, a few friends and I left at around 9.30 p.m. and we noticed a helicopter in the sky with a bright floodlight attached to it, seemingly scanning the area. We proceeded to the party and didn't fret over it. The party was on the other side of campus, and so we missed all the sirens and flashing lights racing up and down the street. We got back from the party at around 11 p.m., and I immediately noticed that not only was the first helicopter still in the air around my on-campus apartment, there was a steady stream of police cars, ambulances, and fire trucks driving up and down the street nearby. However, none of them had their lights nor sirens on, so I wasn't alarmed. The next day, the internet informed me that an SUV was found ablaze in the parking lot with a woman's body inside. This happened about a half a mile to three-fourths of a mile from where I lived. I guess during the party, the area was crawling with police and other authorities trying to look for clues. My roommate later told me that there was non-stop sirens for a good 20 minutes after I left for the party. In the next few weeks, more info surfaced saying that a man killed his wife and tried to burn her body. He broke her neck as well as bludgeoning her body. If the news article I read is to be trusted, the killer was lighting his wife's body on fire during the same time I was getting dressed up in my woody costume for a party. It wasn't until a few weeks later that I made the connection with the SUV I saw while playing soccer earlier in the day. I find it very chilling that while I was playing soccer, someone was driving within 20 yards of me with a corpse in the car, especially since it was on the campus of a seemingly secure university in a very safe city. This incident happened to me last year on Halloween. My little brother and I were home alone since our parents had gone out to a Halloween party. They had tasked us with handing out candy to the trick-or-treaters. This bummed my brother and I out because we made plans to go trick-or-treating with a few friends. Our parents told us that we were too old to still be trick-or-treating and that we could instead invite our friends over to the house and hang out there. My friends declined my invitation to come over because they still wanted to go trick-or-treating themselves. So that left me home alone with my brother handing out candy. A lot of people stopped by our house and by 10 o'clock, Almost all the candy was gone. My brother and I decided that we'd just eat the rest. We were sitting on the couch, watching a scary movie, stuffing ourselves with candy, when there was a knock at the door. I stormed off the couch, wondering who the hell would be knocking on our door this late. I assumed it was just some late night trick-or-treaters. Even if that was the case, I had turned the porch light and Halloween decorations off which should have been a dead giveaway that we were out of candy or that we weren't home, so I assumed it was my parents. Being cautious, I looked through the people and saw a suspicious man standing on our front porch. He was wearing a black hoodie with the hood over his head, which made it difficult to see his face. The only detail of his face I could spot was that he had a beard and dry, crusty lips. There was no way that this guy was a trick-or-treater because he wasn't wearing a costume and was far too old to be trick-or-treating alone. His hands were stuffed in the front pocket of his hoodie and he also looked very thin. Every single red flag went off in my head about this guy. There was no way in hell I was going to open that door. Still looking through the peephole, I watched as he knocked on the door again. He seemed desperate for us to open the door and was shaking a bit. It wasn't cold outside, definitely not cold enough for someone to be trembling. 
He was giving me a bad vibe, and I wanted to get rid of him as soon as possible. We're out of candy, I shouted to him. I watched as a smile spread across his face. It wasn't a friendly smile either. Are you alone in there? The man asked, almost in a mocking voice. His voice was raspy and dry. Should I call the police? My little brother asked me quietly, gripping his cell phone. The man let out a low grumble and said, Sounds like you're not alone in there. I continued to watch him through the peephole. His hands were still wedged tightly in his pockets and he was still shaking a bit. I began to wonder if he was armed. I decided to take action and spoke to him in the most intimidating voice I could. Get the fuck away from my house or I'll call the police, I shouted. His smile faded and he bared his teeth. His teeth were piss yellow and I concluded that he was probably some homeless crackhead. He had a look of fury plastered on his face. Fortunately, he left without trying to break in, probably because he knew I wasn't fucking around with him. I didn't stop watching him through the people until I saw him completely off our property. My brother and I breathed a sigh of relief and decided not to call the police. My brother and I were a bit paranoid after this and watched TV until our parents came home. We didn't tell them about the man since he hadn't really tried to harm us. Now when I think back to this, I wish we had called the police because maybe we would have been able to prevent a murder. You see, the next day we found out that the elderly woman who lived a few houses down from us had been brutally murdered. Her neighbor found her lying on her front porch, covered in blood. She had been stabbed multiple times in the chest and neck. My brother and I immediately knew who had done it, and we told the police what we knew. They couldn't do much from the information we had given them, since we hadn't seen many details of his face. They went on the hunt for the man, but never caught him. I blame myself for that poor old lady's murder, because I could have prevented it from happening just by calling the police. I think the most disturbing thing of all is the fact that he didn't take anything from the old lady's house. Her house had been left untouched, but he could have gone in and taken what he wanted since her door was wide open. This means that he just wanted to kill. That was his only intention. He didn't want money or jewelry. He only had the urge to murder. Chica Chee. My dad was the coolest guy on the block, probably because he was one of three black dads who lived in our town. The population is around 98% Caucasian, and that's not an exaggeration. He was a state police officer, intimidating, wore Oakleys before the hipsters, and he was generally a rough-sounding person. Damn do I miss him. But the one thing he feared the most was Halloween. He would tell my sister and I stories at night about his life when he was in high school in a slum in New Jersey, and that every Halloween crazy things would happen. He may have been pulling our legs a bit, but we didn't care. When Halloween would roll around, he would take us out while my mom stayed home to trick or treat. One night in fifth grade, Lexi and I were dressed as a witch and 50s poodle skirt girl. Dad held our hands walking to the last street when I realized I'd lost mom's scarf she'd let me borrow. Now she loved that thing, so we walked all the way back towards this darker corner of our street. It's by the woods in a small stream, but when it's dark you can't see anything. Dad said he'd seen something and walked towards it. When he got there, he started slowing down. He was staring at something in the dark that we couldn't see. Lexi called out to him if he found mom's scarf. He told her to be quiet and started crouching down looking in the distance. For several moments we stood there waiting. I could make out the scarf above his head tied to a branch. He grabbed the scarf still staring in the dark and started backing away. Then my dad screamed and sort of shuffled backwards. It was a low throaty scream like he was furious. 
He was swearing too, but I don't remember what. Whatever dad had been staring at then bolted out of the trees and ran down the street, opposite of where we lived. It was a little child, probably a boy from his silhouette shape, in a black costume with skeleton bones on the front and a skull mask. When Lexi and I tried to go over and see what had happened, dad yelled for us to stay back. He got onto his ancient cell phone and called mom to come pick us up. His next call was to the local police. We left before we could see anything, but the next day mom told us about the dead, skinned animals that had been found. By the time us kids could go back, they taped off the place and taken out the bloody animals, but there were stains on the pavement and the smell was really bad. The kids talked about it a little in school and I was curious if they ever caught the boy. Nothing came out in the local papers though, and it was quickly forgotten. Eventually, I know my dad could have told us more, but it was the last Halloween we'd ever spend together. Chick -a One of my roommates, some friends, and myself left to go to a party around dusk, and were suddenly catcalled by a group of three drifters or homeless people. We thought nothing of it and went on our merry way. About four hours later we were going back to our apartment to change shoes. High heels and messed up streets are hell when you've been drinking. When one of the drifters calls out to me, Hey beautiful, how about a kiss? Me being a little drunk and sassy, I reply, No thanks, girls are more my type. To my shock and horror, he says, Hey, my friend here likes the ladies. A homeless girl comes out of nowhere and proceeds to kiss me on the mouth. My friend picks me up and throws me over his shoulder. I proceed to flip the fuck out in my apartment, shrug it off, and we venture back out. Well, I got separated from my group in the crowd, and then I see the three drifters again. I try not to show that I'm shitting bricks when they ask me where they can find a liquor store. I point down the street to the Kroger and they say, Okay, you can show us. I'm a small woman and they shove me into their vehicle. I think, naively at the time, that they would literally let me out at the grocery store, except it's closed because it's after midnight. I plead for them to let me out of the car, but they keep saying, the power does what it wants, and headed away from the safety of the campus area onto the freeway and out of the state. For the next few hours, I visited three states with them while pleading for my life. I'll never forget how they kept saying, the power does what it wants, and talking about how they were going to have fun with me. I kind of resigned myself to the fact that I was going to die and I would never graduate college or see my family again. They pulled into a gas station, and I slipped out of the vehicle to be grabbed again, but I screamed my head off for the clerk to help. That's when they talked about taking me to the cliff. I mentioned that my family is full of police officers, and that they're probably already looking for me, and how they're committing a federal crime, and that I won't press charges if they take me back to the campus. I guess that's when the girl started feeling sorry for me, because she started to say, Guys, she's really scared. Maybe we should just drop her off somewhere. This doesn't have to get worse. They took me back to the campus area, and as soon as the girl pulled me out of the car, a police officer called my name. The girl shoved me toward the cop and yelled, The power does what it wants, and tonight it let you live. I've never been so happy to sit in a cruiser. They pursued them, but I don't know if they ever were caught. My roommate dropped out of college and joined the military, and I transferred to another school. So ladies and gentlemen, please be careful walking at night. Always keep your cell phone with you if possible, and call the police if you see suspicious people near your apartment. I had a brush with death that day and I am so grateful for the time I have now.
Halloween has, unfortunately, never been a big deal out here in Scotland, and that's always bummed me out because I love Halloween. But after this year, I think I'll be happy never to celebrate it again. My street and the next street over have a lot of young kids who go out trick-or-treating. So while I was out shopping all day with my mom, we decided to pick up some sweets in case anyone came to our door. I had plans to go to the cinema to see Ouija with my boyfriend, so when I got home I was getting myself ready to go out and my mom was busy putting the shopping away. So when the first load of kids came to the door, I was the one who had to answer it. There were children from our street, the next one over and some I couldn't recognize, as well as an adult at the end of the path. I guessed either a father or an older brother by their size, and they were dressed in all black and had some sort of mask covering their faces, but it wasn't anything I recognized from a movie or anything. Anyway, they all told me their jokes and I gave them their treats and they made their way back down the path and onto the next house. I was about to close the door when I noticed that the guy with the kids was still standing at the end of my path. He hadn't noticed and he wasn't watching the children either. He was looking right at me and my skin started to crawl when I realized that he was just there, staring at me. I backed slowly into my house and watched him as he raised his hand and waved very slow at me and I was about to call out to him when my mom came to the door to make sure I was alright and he took off in the opposite way from the children. He hadn't been with them at all and he left as soon as he realized I wasn't home alone. I was completely freaked out and told my boyfriend all about it when he came to the house to pick me up, but I quickly forgot all about it while we were watching the movie. I finally got home when it was getting really late and trick-or-treating was well and truly over around here. When I got inside, my mom was just getting ready to take the dogs out for a walk so that they could do their last-minute business and they would meet my dad on his way home from work, so I was going to be home alone. Now after my horrible experience earlier, I don't really like the idea of being home alone, and it was only made worse on Halloween, and it always has been. Anyway, I was home alone and I grabbed some snacks and went to my bedroom and onto my computer so that I could do some of my writing, scroll through Tumblr, and listen to music. After my first creepy encounter with the guys coming into my house and into my backyard, my dad bought a motion-censored light and attached it to the wall of our house right outside my window. Normally it will go off whenever a cat walks along our fence, but it will usually go off after a couple of minutes. I always know when the light has come on because it lights up my whole room, given where it's placed, and while I was sitting at my computer, the light came on. I ignored it at first because I knew it would soon go off, but five minutes passed and it still hadn't gone off, so I opened my blinds to have a look outside and see what was going on. My stomach almost fell out of my ass when I looked out and saw the creep from hours before sitting on the fence, waving at my window to keep the light on. His waving slowed down suddenly when he spotted me, and it was all seriously creepy again, and I didn't know what to do. I just got flashbacks from before. Luckily, I heard the front door open and my parents coming into my house with the dogs, so I rushed down the stairs and started screaming at them about the guy on the fence. My dad didn't question me. He just took the dogs and rushed through the house, through the back door opening and ran outside, and then I heard him shouting, Get the fuck out of here, you creep! I'm going to call the police. Dad scared him off, but I convinced him not to call the police because I didn't want to relive the whole thing again. I just wanted to go to sleep and forget about the whole night completely. Halloween is my favorite holiday. Is, not was. Despite the events that unfolded one crisp Hallow's Eve when I was about 16, at the time I lived with my parents, younger brother, older stepbrother and cousin, in a big but old house that sat in a cul-de-sac close to Main Street. 
Behind it ran an alleyway flanked by apartments, and it had a huge yard that my basement bedroom looked out on. We lived in a small town. Crime seemed minimal in that area, and I'd made my way out that Halloween night to make the most of the best day of the year. It wasn't just what happened that night, though. It was, of course, what came after, and one small incident that came before. A few days before Halloween, my stepbrother and cousin arrived home to discover a pickup truck full of dudes taking photos of her house. Weird. But when approached, the men seemed friendly and complimented our Halloween setup. It was pretty great, that is true. The men sped off without incident and were quickly forgotten. My stepbrother and cousin re-entered the story Halloween night, the big event itself at about 3 a.m., Both had been out drinking with their friends, and as such, both had left their respective vehicles and braved the icy walk home on their own. Cousin arrived home first, but couldn't seem to get his key in the lock, so just sat on the porch bench and waited for my stepbrother to show up. He did about half an hour later. After having a bit of a laugh at my cousin for being an uncoordinated goober, he went to unlock the door himself and, no luck so they bit the bullet and called my mom, waking her up and let them in. She, of course, unimpressed to be opening the door for a pair of drunk idiots at this time of night and didn't buy their story about the wonky lock. They insisted, though, and to shut them up, she finally relented and tried her key. She, too, could not get her key in the lock. Annoyed, tired, and now just confused, she wrote it off as a problem for tomorrow and the three of them hit their respective hay. One other person arrived home late that night, me. Though I arrived much earlier than these two, and was in bed by about midnight, I woke up close to 1am. Still tired, all I could feel was anxiety, and I didn't know why. At first I tried to tell myself that I'd just gotten a bit too into the holiday spirit, and psyched myself out. But then I noticed a shadow. It was perfectly man-shaped and cast upon my window. I turned on my bedside lamp, blinked and it was gone. It wasn't unusual, mind you, to see the shadows of people harmlessly walking through the alley and I told myself that's all there was to it. Then there was what happened after. I came home from school the next day. My parents were there and so was a locksmith and so were the police. My parents were there because, well, that's where they live. The locksmith was there because my mother had called him as the confusion over the broken lock persisted. The cops were there because the locksmith and my parents had called them when the locksmith proceeded to pull the tip of a knife out of our lock. I was relieved to see that that's where the knife tip had ended up though, as they discovered two of our window screens had been slashed one on our garage, and one on my bedroom window. My mom and sister went to my neighbor's house, leaving me alone in the house. It was about 4.30 and already beginning to get dark. I took that opportunity to sneak upstairs into the attic to try on some Halloween stuff. I quickly ran up the steps, knowing that if my mum came back and caught me, I would be in deep trouble. Although all the windows were shut, I felt a cold breeze pass through me, but I thought nothing of it at first because I had no past experience of paranormal phenomena. I rummaged through the bag of Halloween costumes and pulled out a witch's hat, which I tried on for size. Almost immediately, Some unseen force hit the hat. I dropped the bag and quickly turned around, but found nothing against which I could have knocked the hat. As I bent down to pick up the bag, I saw the handle to the bathroom door turn and the door rapidly open. I walked cautiously into the bathroom, wondering what had caused the door to open in such a way. I suddenly had a feeling that there was another presence within the room. I looked out of the window to check if my mother and sister were still outside. 
and sure enough, they were. Just as I was about to turn away from the window, I saw the reflection of the cupboard door sliding open. I turned around hastily to try and see what was causing these incidents, but I wasn't quick enough to catch whatever it was. Terrified, I threw the bag back into the cupboard box and ran downstairs and out into the front garden, waiting anxiously for my mom to return home. That night, I had a nightmare about what might have followed if I'd stayed up there any longer. Evil, gleaming red eyes stared at me from the bathroom cupboard, locking me in the bathroom and causing complete havoc around the house. Several unexplainable things have happened up there since then, including self-breaking objects. But what was it, besides my own equilibrium, that I disturbed in that attic that evening? It was Halloween evening 1995, when Pamela and her brother were heading home on a country road near Greenbelt, Maryland. As it was darkening, Pamela reckons they were moving at about 25 to 30 miles per hour on the two-lane road, with her brother at the wheel. Suddenly appearing behind them and approaching quickly was a black vehicle with two large, round and glaringly bright headlights. Almost as quickly, the car was beside them and on the left, as if trying to pass. But, Pamela says, it seemed that the old black car was floating rather than riding the pavement. This old car was in the path of head-on traffic, Pamela recalls. It seemed like those other cars kept going on without interruption. My brother and I looked over inside the car, and there were four young teenagers, two young men and two young ladies. Strangely, they looked to be dressed in farm clothing from the 1930s or 1940s, and they all looked as white as ghosts. The young lady in the front passenger seat turned her head slowly to Pamela and her brother and smiled, then turned back. The two people in the back seat just stared. Then, inexplicably, the car floated past them and vanished into thin air. But that's not the end of this ghost story. In 1997, my brother and I were on the same road around the same time again coming home, Pamela says, and the same spirits appeared and repeated the same scene. In 1998, my brother was alone driving home on this road, and the same ghosts appeared again, repeating the same scenario. Maybe these teens were going out on Halloween and got into some terrible accident. They are clearly stuck on this road driving. God rest their souls. On Halloween, many people test their bravery by venturing into dark cemeteries. Sarah and her husband, who had always been fascinated by the unknown, decided to do just that on the Halloween night of 2002. It was an experience, she says, that changed her life. We chose Blood Cemetery in McWanago, Wisconsin, Sarah tells us. I think it goes by a different name now, but the Blood family was the first African-American family in that town, and they are buried in that cemetery near a statue of a book on a pillar. Sarah's husband used to live in that town, and often heard tales of supernatural events occurring in the cemetery. This got Sarah's juices flowing, so armed with a camera, two flashlights and an audio recording device, they headed into the tiny cemetery. We headed for the Blood Monument first, she says. After waiting around in vain for the Blood family to show themselves, we did a little walking around. We were about 48 feet away from the Blood Monument when something made me turn around and look back at it. I saw what appeared to be a giant blue orb. It was about the size and shape of a human head, and about that far off the ground. I didn't look long enough to make out a face, so I could not tell you if it was truly a face or not. 
That's all it took for Sarah and her husband to run out of the cemetery at a speed they never imagined they could attain. Although the ground was dry, they both stumbled and tripped as they ran. Her husband said he felt as though he was being sucked into the ground, but Sarah swore it felt more like hands grabbing at her ankles and pants. At the outer edge of the cemetery, they caught their breath and gathered their courage for one more short walk around the gravestones with the audio recorder and camera. I tried to open myself up a little, and I was lured to a random area of the cemetery, says Sarah. We stood there for about ten seconds, until I felt the sudden urge to run. I said, oh my god, we have to go. I started running with all my might. My husband followed. I turned and I snapped a picture of the spot we were standing. When we got back to the car, we listened to the audio. This is what we heard, the shuffling of our feet in the leaves, and then it stops. Get out. The voice was obviously not human, but not quite animal, Sarah is certain. It was a demon. The picture showed a whole lot of nothing, except for two little red eyes. High schoolers and even college students seem to love Halloween as much as little kids do. It's an opportunity to challenge their fears of the unknown and to indulge in scary pranks. Chris will never forget the Halloween of 1981 when he was enrolled at a college in his hometown. Chris and five or six of his friends decided to check out a small cemetery at the edge of campus. A rusty, worn chain-link fence encircled the few graves of past college faculty and their relatives. It wasn't long before I felt something, Chris remembers. A few minutes later, I heard the crunch and rhythm of footsteps shuffling through the leaves on the ground. Some of the others heard it too, and we all looked in the direction of the footsteps, and when we didn't see anything, we assumed it was another friend trying to scare us. They all laughed it off at first, but the sound of the footsteps continued. Every couple of minutes, Chris would look down the length of the fence. He squinted his eyes, trying to find the prankster in the dark, but he couldn't see anyone, even as the crunch of leaves got louder and closer. Then, to the left of his vision, Coming from the dark edge of the woods, Chris saw it. Vague in shape, he was definitely cloaked in black head to foot, Chris says. It seemed to move in spurts of speed. And then, as though time fast forward, it would be ahead of my speed of sight, closer to me than before until it stopped at the corner post of the fence. The figure changed shape from a thin, tall form as it turned to its left and faced the students. It was cloaked and hooded, although Chris could make out no arms nor eyes to look at for familiarity. There was no shape of feet, even though the hem of its cloak floated inches above the leaves and grass. Scared, Chris wheeled away from the whole affair, and without saying a word to his friends, ran uphill to the first lighted building he could find. I felt someone was running beside me, he says. I was relieved when I saw one of my friends. We stopped running and asked each other what we saw, and we both said the same words, saw the same vision. Since that night, I have seen my friend often, except for one occasion a couple of years after that Halloween, we have never talked about what we saw that night. Halloween often inspires people to break out their Ouija boards, even if the talking board has been sitting gathering dust on a shelf the rest of the year. Bea and her friends Ingrid, Anna, Laura and May 
decided to experiment with the board one night some years ago in Bia's large house in Australia. Bia's parents were away on business and her brother and sister were visiting an uncle in South Australia, so she and her friends had the house to themselves for a sleepover. Naturally, sleep was the last thing on their minds. Anna, who was really into seances and the paranormal, suggested playing with the Ouija board, which she brought with her. I have two Pomeranian dogs, Muffy, Tan, and Shadow, Black, says Bia and my friend Ingrid has a white Pomeranian called Haley. Muffy, Shadow, and Haley, along with Anna's dog, Ernie, and Laura's two dogs, Archie and Rosie, were all in the backyard, and we hadn't heard a peep out of them for about an hour. Upstairs in Bia's bedroom, the girls arranged themselves in a circle with Anna's Ouija board in the center. They each placed two fingers on the planchette. Anna started by asking the board, is anybody there? The board moved to yes. Then Ingrid asked, Who? And the board spelled out, Gail. Who are you? Another girl asked. Again the board spelled out only Gail. More detail, another requested. But the board only replied, Gail. What's going to happen tonight? Bia asked. Dogs the board spelled. What are you going to do to our dogs? You'll see, replied the Ouija. Bia pushed the board aside and the girls just sat there staring at each other. The silence was soon broken by a piercing whimper from the backyard. The five girls jumped up and raced down the stairs, fearing for their dogs. We flung the back door open and raced out, says Bia. We soon discovered Laura's dog Archie whimpering in a corner. We didn't even take a second glance at any of them. We simply picked up our dogs, all of them were small ones, and ran them inside up to my room. Once we had them upstairs, we fussed around inspecting every inch of them. Laura screamed, and we rushed over to see her holding Archie who had a burn mark on his left side in the shape of a pentagram in a circle. We spent the whole night with the dogs in our arms and vowed to burn the board the next morning. The following incident happened on Halloween night 2005. The only reason this is burned into my memory is because about six of us were witness to it so it often comes up in conversations. There is a legend nearby, deep in the dark woods of an old haunted mill. The story behind it is that a family of three used to live there, a father, mother, and their four-year-old son. The mother apparently went crazy and drowned her son in the pond next to the house. When the father came home from working at the mill and found his son, he attacked the mother and the fight ended in the attic, with the mother shooting the father in the head with a rifle. It is said that she hid his body beneath the floorboards, then hung herself up in the attic. The legend suggests if you go up in the attic and call the woman degrading names, she will appear to you. So, being the bored kids that we were, my five friends and I piled into my little car and drove to the haunted mill. I had my digital camera and was anxious to capture images of some ghosts. I'm a bit of a skeptic too and I'm always finding excuses for the so-called orbs in photographs, constantly insisting that they are flecks of dust, bugs or drafts of light. The woods that the mill is settled in are always very dark, so the moonlight hardly penetrated the trees as we arrived at the old stone house. We all crept out of the car and were startled to see two large black horses standing in front of the house. I quickly snapped a picture of them. Then we moved around, trying to find a way in. To our dismay, the only opening was a small window through the basement. We had to get down on our hands and knees to crawl through. As I bent down, I felt someone push me from behind. 
I cried out and looked around to see I was in last place, and I put my hand down to catch my balance, only to cry out again as my hand caught something thorny. I looked down and saw nothing unusual. Upon examining my hand, everything looked fine. It felt like I had barbs sticking into my skin, yet I couldn't see anything. After we all squeezed in through the opening, we turned on our flashlights and began exploring the house. The walls to our surprise were all drywall, and we realized that the house wasn't as old as we had originally thought. Yet they were covered in graffiti, a lot of upside-down crosses and 666 signs, which didn't do much to calm our nerves. Finally, we made it up to the attic. We all huddled together in the centered and held hands. Nobody wanted to shout the curses, so I, being the skeptic, and therefore the bravest, decided to take on that role. I shouted some choice words in the darkness around us, and we all held our breath, waiting. Nothing happened. We waited for about 50 minutes with no apparition of the woman's ghost. With a mixture of relief and disappointment, we turned and headed down the stairs. Somehow I got in last place again, so I turned and snapped one more picture of the empty attic. I swear to you, as my flash bounced off the walls, I saw a lone female figure standing in the back corner. Terrified, I ran down the steps after my friends. No more incidences happened, although when we got outside, the horses were nowhere to be found. I took one more picture of the house, one of the old crumbling barn, one of the pond and one of the eerie little shack we found in the backyard. Then we once again all piled into my car and left the premises. When we got back to my friend's house, we hooked up my camera to the TV so we could sift through the pictures on a large screen. The results were creepy, to say the least. A picture of the horses captured them standing there, staring at us. Their eyes were red. Now I know that often happens to people's and animals' eyes in pictures, but it was still unsettling to look at. The rooms in the house all had millions of orbs in them. I brushed it off until we viewed the pictures of the barn, the pond, and the little shack. None of those had any orbs. Yet the picture of the house had tons of them. Weird. The attic photos showed nothing unusual, unfortunately, so nobody believed me when I said I thought I saw something. But the last picture that someone had snapped of the side of the house was the creepiest. A few orbs appeared in the air, but one orb in particular was an odd bluish-purple color and there was the distinct outline of a skull. I have the pictures still to this day, and everyone I have shown them to all agree that they are very strange, and the skull picture, as we dubbed it, is the most chilling picture I have ever took. The weird thing is, the skull is looming directly over the place where I had snagged my hand on something, and in the following days, an odd rash appeared all over my fingers. It eventually went away, but the doctors had no idea what it was, and neither do I. Every Halloween around midnight in our living room, I see a white figure of a little boy just staring at me. This first happened in 2005 the year my mom and I first moved in to our apartment. I was 10 years old and my mom was sleeping. Usually I can't sleep on Halloween because I get too scared. That year, I couldn't close my eyes without feeling someone sneaking into my room. When I first saw it, it was about 1am and I was just lying in my bed thinking about the Halloween that had just passed. I started to drift off. Then I felt as if someone or something was tickling my feet. So I opened my eyes, and that was when I saw him. I distinctly remember that he was all the way over by the wall. 
I closed my eyes, thinking that it was just my imagination. But when I opened them again, he was closer than he was before. I ran into my mom's room and told her what I saw. Of course, she didn't believe me, and she told me to go back to sleep. So I went back to my room and fell asleep. I dreamed of the boy in white all through the rest of the night, and it scared me incredibly badly. The thing about it is, as I see him every year, he gets clearer and clearer, and he also gets bigger and bigger, as if he is growing up with me. I'm 13 now, and he also looks about 13. It happened in London on October 31st, Halloween. I was making the rounds at my Halloween party looking for my seven-year-old son, and I couldn't find him. I went to his room and he wasn't there, but then I heard him laughing in the wardrobe. I opened the wardrobe, and he was the only one in there, laughing. I just thought he was doing what normal kids do, playing, until later on. The party was all over and I was cleaning up. I couldn't find my son again, so I went upstairs and checked the wardrobe. He was in there laughing again. This time I asked him what he was doing. I'm playing with Mary, he replied. I thought this time one of the kids was in there with him, hiding, so I opened the other side of the wardrobe. There was nobody there so I thought that he had an imaginary friend. I told him to stop talking about an imaginary friend because it's not real, and then I went downstairs to clean more. Two hours later at 10 p.m., I'd finished cleaning up and my son was already in bed. I was tired, so I went to bed. When I went into my room, I found a message written in my lipstick on the mirror saying, You're wrong. I am real. I am Bloody Mary. As soon as I saw this, I rushed to my son's room only to find him with bloody scratches all over his arms, legs, and face. He shouted at me, I hate you. This wouldn't have happened if you said that she was real. It was Halloween 2004. It all happened in my cousin's house at Antipolo City, Philippines. It was a nice day, and I was so excited that I would be seeing my cousins and other relatives. I had been spending my summer months with them for years, and we have this tradition of making the most out of our time together. That day, my cousin and I went to buy music CDs and decided to grab a DVD movie so we could hang out at home watching and enjoying R&B sounds. We decided to go straight back home to my cousin's house to listen to the CDs we bought. We took the back entrance of their house leading to the second floor, where we saw her nanny and niece. My cousin decided to stay in her room for a few minutes, and as for me, I started taking the stairs down to the ground floor of the house. The ground floor part of my cousin's house had been abandoned for about three months, my other two cousins had used two bedrooms down there, but now they had to vacate the ground floor to reserve it for guests during special occasions only. The house itself had three floors, yet there are only five people who live in it. As I took the last step of the stairs, at the side of my eyes I saw a dark, tall shadow, about six feet tall, pass by the kitchen door at my left. I just ignored it though, since then I was more excited about listening to the CDs, and I had been seeing a lot of those shadows in the past years, so at this point I was kind of used to it. I took one of the CDs and began to play it on the stereo with just a minimal volume, just for me to relax. As I was sitting on the couch, my cousin came into the living room and turned the stereo volume up very loud. As we were enjoying the music, Suddenly the volume dropped down to zero. I just stared at it, wondering how it happened. 
My cousin even got mad at me because she thought I was the one who lowered the volume using the remote control. I just looked at her and pointed at the remote control on the top of the stereo. Realizing that I wasn't responsible, my cousin suddenly ran upstairs, screaming, dead scared to stay in the living room. I was left alone, trying to analyze what had just happened. A few seconds after that, I ran upstairs too to check on my cousin. Surprisingly, the nanny upon seeing me told me that she also heard strange sounds while we were down in the living room. She explained that the sounds that she had heard upstairs were like humming frogs or crickets. After about an hour, my cousin and I went downstairs again to watch a movie. When something strange happened, while watching, we suddenly felt scared because we could hear the sounds from the previous scenes of the movie, like a long delayed echo. It seemed like something was actually trying to mimic the movie, particularly the sounds. Finally, we made up our minds to stop watching and just listen to the CDs, this time a lot louder. We also switched on all the lights on the ground floor. This time, my cousin even shouted at the ghost. This is when I'm able to spend time with my cousin, so beat it. From there we went on enjoying the sounds and chatting with each other. During the height of our enjoyment, one of the figurines from the top of the stereo flew off and crashed on the floor. My cousin wasn't scared. In fact, she got mad because it was her mom's favorite figurine. At first we thought it was the strong vibration of the speakers that caused the figurine to fall. But there were many other items on top of the speakers, some a lot lighter than the figurine, so why just that one? Also, it didn't just fall, it was more like it was thrown. We knew we weren't welcome anymore. Something was trying to hinder us from staying in that particular part of the house. We found out that it wasn't just us who experienced weird things in that living room, but also my other cousins and most of the people who used to work there as nannies for them. These former nannies had left without a word, even without getting paid. Perhaps they were in fear of getting harmed or bothered by that same shadow entity. This experience is very dear to me, though it grows blurry with time, Satori tells us. Memory fades like breath upon a mirror, especially ones that were dim to begin with. But this is what I remember. I do not know exactly what I saw, but I do know it changed me. Satori's experience took place at an all-girls Catholic college she attended, where it was rumored there was a particular bathroom that was haunted. The girls frequently talked about the icy air in this room and of hearing and seeing strange things and a feeling of being watched. Satori dismissed them as tall tales. One Halloween, however, Satori and her friend decided to go and talk to the spirit. They went into one of the bathroom stalls that had a bathtub because it was said to be the center of the haunting energy. My friend got into the bathtub and started feeling around, Satori says. I did too. And I felt the most amazing feeling, a tingling, like electric current coming from the walls and faucets. I was stunned, but oddly enough not afraid. Elated was more the word. We got out of the tub and that's when I saw it. The pale image of a young girl with dark hair and deep, sad eyes. She was wearing some kind of slip. Her wrists were cut, and her blood was dripping down the drain. She looked like me. Again, I did not feel fear, only sympathy. I think she put the razor in the soap dish, I said to my friend. I know, she answered. Suddenly, I felt this presence, this tingling warm feeling inside, 
like the way your arms prickle before a storm. I said to it, Come out, don't be afraid. And the feeling got stronger. Then I said, It's okay, we understand. You can go back. And the feeling seemed to move upward in my body until it disappeared. Then there was no more energy. When the girl stood to leave, however, Satori was stricken with an overwhelming feeling of sadness and loneliness. I knew she did not want us to leave, Satori says. I said to her gently, I'm so sorry, but we can't help you. You need to go back now. Then I felt the sadness lift, and the room grew lighter. I felt her leave. She never returned, and no one spoke of her again. But I will never forget her. She taught me a lesson. Compassion heals all wounds, whether alive or dead. There's a reason that Halloween takes place in autumn. If it was celebrated in the sweltering summer, or at the height of winter, it wouldn't be the same, would it? No, Halloween, or All Hallows' Eve, is perfectly timed. Twilight comes early, the air is chilled, the trees shed their decaying leaves, and the earth prepares for its dark sleep, for death. It's no wonder we all get creeped out this time of year. We become more aware that there are things, unknown things, out there in the dark. Here are three true stories of Halloween time encounters with the unexplained. Number one, the evil black dog. J.F. lives in a small area of Texas called Del Valle, where there is little more than gas stations, schools, houses, and cows. She usually considered this place rather boring, but one night a few days before Halloween would change all that for her. On this night, J.F. was driving her boyfriend to his house at about 8.30 p.m. Being a person who says she can almost always sense immediate danger or evil, J.F.'s heart began to beat rapidly. For some unknown reason, chills ran down her spine, and she began to perspire, even though she had the car's A.C. on full blast. I was getting an eerie feeling that something evil was up ahead, she says. We are all familiar with how an animal's eyes glow in a creepy way when a light is shown into them. Up the hill, about two minutes from my house, a black dog walked right in front of my car, JF says. She thought it was peculiar that the animal was just casually walking across the road without any apparent fear of getting hit by her car. I hit the brakes and managed to stop about five feet from the dog, she remembers. It just stood there and stared at me. I turned on my high beams and when I saw its eyes, they turned a golden reddish tint. It stood there for about a minute, then walked away. I hit the gas and sped off, terrified. But when I looked back, the dog was nowhere in sight. JF proceeded home, but could not shake the weird feeling of dread that overcame her before and during her encounter with that black dog. Was it a harbinger of something more terrifying? J.F. believes it was a catalyst for a very disturbing dream a few nights later. I dreamed that I was in my room listening to music when it all of a sudden stopped 
she recalls vividly. I looked at my iPod, and it was still playing, but there was no sound. I looked at my door, and there was a man in a black trench coat staring at me. It wasn't the fact that there was a man in my room that freaked me out. It was his face. It was red with black cracks all over, and he had horns. His eyes were a deep gold with no pupil, and he had long fangs coming out of his mouth. I just sat there staring at him. Then he said, It's time. And that's when I noticed a watch in his left hand. When he spoke, his breath came out as smoke and reeked of burning, spoiled meat. He made a grab for my neck, and that's when I woke up. The first smell that came to me was burning, spoiled meat. JF continues to be haunted by those connected experiences. I can never be outside now, not at night. Demons and ghosts exist outside. I have purified my room because it seems that's where I'm most vulnerable. These entities seem to appear when I'm trying to enjoy life. Number 2. Happy Halloween Fairy Storybook fairies have been traditional Halloween costumes for many years. What Richard saw at Halloween time in 2008, however, was no costume child. It was the night of the elementary school Halloween party, and Richard had taken his children to the school in central New Jersey to attend. The party was held in the school's large cafeteria, which was decked out in Halloween decorations and orange floodlights. A DJ played music, and a costume teacher greeted the children with her Halloween bag, glowing with orange lights. As the children enjoyed the festivities, Richard ducked outside to the parking lot to catch a quick smoke. He could still keep an eye on the kids from outside through the windows. As he was standing there smoking, Richard noticed a tiny but intensely bright orange light dancing about at the treetops near the tree line past the end of the parking lot. At first, he didn't think much of it. Perhaps it was just a reflection of the orange floodlights, he thought. But the more he watched it, the more puzzling it seemed. What is that anyway? he asked himself. The glowing orange light was fluttering around like a butterfly in erratic up and down motions and from side to side. I considered that perhaps someone had a Halloween light suspended from a string on a pole, he says, and was bobbing it about because that's what it looked like. But that didn't make sense either. This fluttering light was 20 feet off the ground, could it have been a remote-controlled flying toy of some kind? While I pondered this, says Richard, it flew toward the tree line and disappeared. I went down to the end of the parking lot to see if there was any people in the grass near the trees. Other than what appeared to be a person sleeping in one of the cars, there was nobody in sight. I can only conclude that this must have been a fairy enjoying the holiday festivities. Number 3. The Troll Amanda's Halloween experience took place in 2008, right before the holiday, and no matter how much she tries, she cannot forget or convince herself that she was mistaken in what she saw. I was driving to my parents' house for Sunday dinner, Amanda says. It was a trip from Amanda's home near Pincrest in Campbell County, Tennessee, 
to her parents' more rural home, five miles further out of town. It was a sunny fall day at about four o'clock in the afternoon, and Amanda was driving rather fast on the winding road with her daughter in the front seat. She was a bit late. I came around a curve in the road, she says, and suddenly had to swerve the car sharply to the driver's side to avoid hitting something sitting on the edge of the road on the passenger's side. I slowed down and got a good look at it, and I have no idea what I saw. It, whatever it was, was sitting slightly in the road with its legs stretched out in front of it. Its back was facing the road and its legs were in someone's driveway. At first I thought it was a Halloween decoration some moron had put on the road for a joke because it looked like a stuffed dummy or something. I saw it back too at first and it wore all black, a black hat and had straight black hair coming to just past its collar. I say it looked like a dummy because it was sort of slumped over and the back of its coat looked lumpy like it was stuffed with leaves. Amanda passed it slowly in her car, rather annoyed at the prank because it nearly caused her to wreck her car. But then it became apparent that this was no Halloween dummy. It turned and looked at me, she says. The best way I can describe its face is that it looked sunken and wrinkled like a dried apple. Its face was also solid black like the rest of it and it didn't move except a glance over its shoulder at me. My daughter looked at me, shocked and I hit the gas and sped away. I was horrified and told my mother about it when I arrived there, describing it as a, as ridiculous as it sounds. I called it a troll. She laughed at me, even though my daughter supported my story and insisted that it had been someone in a costume. But why would they be sitting in such a dangerous spot in the road like that? I don't have a clue what it could have been, but I've never seen it again. Neither have I forgotten it, unfortunately. I think about it every time I pass that driveway. My family still teases me about my troll sighting, so I don't tell anyone about it anymore.